morning. It is 8.38, Wednesday, July 29th. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And with today being moving day, I'm tired. I feel like I want to vomit. And it's the perfect <laughs> environment for hosting a podcast. I am Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. Baseball is back. My team, the Red Sox, is one in five. And already I'm giving up on the season. <laughs> Jonathan Green, uh, general manager of DJ Stable. And Joe, your description of how you feel should be the way that Bill feels about his resume. <laughs> Who says I don't feel that way? <laughs> I'm Alan Carrasso, managing editor of TDN. And in honor of the way we're doing things in Major League Ballpark, I have some cardboard cutouts sitting directly in front of me <laughs> that you can't see. And we're going to pipe in some, some fan noise when I say something clever. Crowd <laughs> goes wild. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Are the cardboard cutouts of like secretariat and personal ensign or are they of like family members? No, listen, I got John Green here, John Green here, and John Green here. Uh, you poor bastard. I don't even have that in my own house. <laughs> no mirrors. No mirrors for Jack. <laughs> no, obviously. <laughs> the TDN Writers Room was brought to you by Keeneland. Entries for the industry leading 2020 Keeneland November breeding stock sale to be held at the home of the Breeders' Cup World Championships are now open through August 3rd. Learn more at november.keenland.com. All right, so we're going to start with the last weekend's recap. I thought it was a really super interesting weekend of racing. I posted something on Twitter late on Friday that I thought three of the most interesting horses in the world were all running on Saturday, starting with the Naval and then Volatile and Maximum Security. Um, I'll, do, I'll do all three, and then you guys can chime in, and then we can mention anybody else that might have caught your eye over the weekend. Obviously, Enable was great to see her back to her top uh, peak, you know, she, this was the first time in her career she had suffered back-to-back -back losses, albeit in the arc and in the Coral Clips. Lost to two very good horses, so it's not like she was disgraced in those races, but there was at least some kind of question as a six-year-old if she was still the same, quite the same mare, but she certainly put that to bed. She only had two rivals, but you know, she blew them away, had, had those horses any time that she wanted. Um, so hopefully we get to see her a couple more times before she retires. It's obviously very sporting to run her at six to begin with. Um, so it, it was great to see her, you know, back in the winner's circle and, and, and back dazzling people. Uh, so that was, that was awesome. Volatile was an interesting one because I thought that was one of the weirdest grade one sprints you'll ever see in your life. It's like, I don't, I don't think you're ever going to see again, the final quarter of a grade one sprint faster than the first quarter. But once Lexitonian scratched, there really was no other pace pressure in the race. And, you know, he came home fast. He came home in under 23. You don't really see that in sprints and dirt sprints at least. So you got to give him credit for that. The buyer figure was never going to be huge because the pace was slow. He got a 102. Um, but, you know, I think, I thought we were going to learn a lot more about him in that race. And we really did it, you know, because of the circumstances. We, we, we knew that he was pretty good. I think we're going to learn more once he gets pressed on the front end against like top class competition. I think we'll learn more about him. Um, I want to lead into maximum security because Bill talked about it in his weekend review, which I thought was, was pretty spot on that. Again, we really didn't learn much about him either. For me, I think it was hard to think that he was the, he's the same horse that he was at least before with Jason service. Now there could be reasons for that. He had the, the Saudi layoff, you know, it was his first race back. He was, he was giving way. And I was going to mention that I will now hand it over to Bill. Uh, Try to chime in on all of that. But okay. I know you all of it. Um, let's see. Okay. Enable was very good. Volatile was very good. And maximum security was, just as you said, okay. I mean, you know, I, I really want to be definitive on this. I don't want to be wishy-washy. And I think going into the races I wrote in, in the week in review, I think everybody was prepared to either love the horse or hate the horse. If he draws off, like you said, to win by five or six, you love him. If he runs a lackluster third, you hate him. And it felt somewhere sort of in between, you know, was he as good as he was in the Saudi cup and the cigar and even in the Kentucky Derby when he was of course disqualified. I, I don't think you can make a case that he was, albeit it was a strange race, the way he was up, back up, had to make a second run and all that. So I'm just going to kick the can down the road on this horse and say, let's see what he does in the Pacific classic. And if he comes back and, and is the maximum security that we saw before the Saudi car, right coming out of the Saudi cup. And I think that's entirely possible. Just as you said, Joe, you have some reasons to think that maybe he wasn't at his very best. You know, Baffert comes out with a comment afterward that he was only 80 percent. 
wish he kind of would have said that beforehand, then I, I would take it a little bit more seriously. You wonder if that's just a little bit trainer speak that you get after a race. But he did have the long layoff, uh, the oddly run race, the weight, et cetera. I'm just going to wait and see and reserve judgment on him. Yeah, I think I think that's pretty fair. I mean, it, you know, we, we were all ready to jump on one bandwagon or the other. Either the horse is toast and shouldn't be running again and what an embarrassment or the horse is back and get ready to, to build a statue next to the Pegasus statue down at Gulfstream. Um, it was a weirdly run race. No question about it. I mean, the horse definitely knocked some rust off, hadn't run since February. Like you guys said, had to make a, you know, a, a cross uh, world, you know, um, trip to come back and then change barns. But the bottom line is he struggled a little bit. He did show some grit down the stretch in, in, in putting away mid court. Um, but they went really, really weird fractions too. I mean, the, the last, the, the last uh, 16th of a mile was over six seconds. Um, you know, the last eighth, uh, excuse me, quarter of a mile was 26. I mean, just, it wasn't like a great race, um, but he won. And now he's on to the Pacific classic. Um, the other two races that, that you want to talk about, I mean, volatile definitely ran a very odd race also in the sense that every quarter was faster than the previous one, 23 and two out of the gate, 23 and one and finished in under 23 seconds. Um, which for a grade one sprint doesn't sound like a very fast time. And, and Joe, you alluded to this. That's why he got the 102 buyer. Um, but look, the horse has done everything they've asked him to. He, he won, you know, it's like old school. He won the A other then, he won the two other then, he won a listed stake, and then he went on to graded uh, stakes. So, um, you know, he's done everything that they've uh, hoped that he can do. He was an $850,000 yearling uh, purchase from Keelan. And he looks like he's going to be a nice horse. And he and, and Vacoma are developing into the top sprinters um, you know, in, in the country right now. The other race I wanted to talk about that, again, I thought was just strange um, was the uh, the Boston Spa, uh, the grade two up at Saratoga in a five horse field, Starship Jubilee, you know, won by a neck. But the thing from an optic standpoint, the thing that looks so weird is that Chad Brown and Peter Brandt had two horses in there. And Tyler Gaffleone was was on North Broadway, who was supposed to be the rabbit. And the rabbit did exactly what it did, what it's supposed to do. It went up to the front. The only problem is nobody told Tyler that he was supposed to wait for somebody else to go with him. So he was up 10, 11 lengths at the top, you know, midway down the, uh, down the, at the back stretch with nobody around him. And the other four horses were kind of like, okay, see you. We're not even worried about you. Um, and then went on to, uh, you know, to run their own race. Um, interestingly enough, that race finished up in under six seconds, you know, five and four for the last 16th of a mile. And the last quarter was in 23. So they really picked it up, um, you know, once they got past the rabbit and, and came home. Um, so those are the three races that stuck out for me um, in a really, really good racing weekend. Um, so I guess I'll start at the beginning. And, and Abel, um, she was great. And, you know, it's always fun to see a horse like that win on the bridle. Like three furlongs out, Detori looks over his left shoulder and says, Hey, Ryan, what are you doing on Japan? Um, you're not doing much. Here I go. So the interesting thing is they ran the, um, the Goodwood Cup yesterday. Uh, Stradivarius is probably the best stayer in the world. Um, but two miles, two and a half is his trip. He's going to back up for the pre foie at Longchamp in September. And then they want to send him to the Ark. And um, Frankie rides both of them. So as John Gosson says, he thinks he knows who Frankie will choose. I think the world knows who Frankie will choose. Um, but it's a great sporting gesture for Stradivarius to drop back. It's hard to say a mile and a half is a sharp trip, but for him it is. Um, you know, the Vanderbilt was, was just strange. Nobody wanted to lead. And Santana said, okay, I'll take it. Nobody pressed him, did what he had to do. And I think no matter what the circumstances, for a dirt sprinter, like you said, Joe, to kick it in in 22 and four home is, you know, that's fantastic. And, and he did what he had to do. I, I think he's the best sprinter in the country. Um, where are we at? Max, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the high road on this. Um, so he broke well. He wanted to lead. Espinoza, who's been known to do this before, um, it kicks up midcourt, goes around him, wants the lead. So Cedillo has a choice to make seven eights out. Do I go with this horse? The pace wasn't fast early, but if they ding dong him, what's he going to have left? 
So there's a discussion or there's a thinking that Cedillo made a tactical mistake. I thought he made the right decision to pull back out of there, um, especially when higher power went up outside of him. I don't think he had any choice but to take a hold. And he took an awkward step, turning up the back, lost some momentum. Listen, he was being hard ridden the last half mile. He carried the 127 and he got the job done. The final three, six, the final five sixteenths was 33 and change. Now, <clears throat> Arrogate did the same thing. Baffert said he didn't like Del Mar. I think that's in part some of the reason that Baffert's not 100% committed to the Pacific Classic. May send him to Saratoga. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens with that. Um, uh, I left him number two on my Breeders' Cup Classic top 10. And I, I think, look, do I, do I think he was the same as he was before? No. Does he have to get better? Yes, I think he will. Balsam Spa, you know, she had, um, Sister Charlie had Thais last year who really went and set fast paces and set it up for her. Um, North Broadway did not go a fast pace. And Sister Charlie had nothing to close into. So um, optically was not good. I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt. I thought it really was was a pretty disappointing effort from her. Um, a mile and a sixteen is probably a little short for her. She probably is better going mile and eighth to a mile and a quarter. But I don't know. She she wasn't that far behind Starship Jubilee, who ended up winning the race. And just that she didn't like change leads until very late. I thought it was just it was a completely one pace effort for her. Um, so I thought that that was really disappointing. And now she's had, you know. The, the Breeders' Cup is the Breeders' Cup, but I thought she was pretty disappointing in the Philly and Mare Turf as well. I didn't love the Flower Bowl that she won before that. I thought it was it was below her best. Uh, so to me, for me at least, I think she's run three subpar for her standard races in a row. And I really, really question whether or not she's, she's the same horse. Um, so maybe if she comes back and, and wins next time, we can have the Sister Charlie back on me there for me. Um, but in maximum security, going back to maximum security for a second, I just I don't understand the people who say that he had had like a bad trip. You know, I you know maybe, yeah maybe like the first furlong was like a little a, a little tougher than they wanted. They wanted either to be on the lead or to, to just be sitting off. He did get squeezed back a little bit, but after that, I thought he had you know kind of the perfect stalking trip and really had no excuse not to just blow by a horse like Midcourt. He had a one hundred and one buyer, which obviously is not terrible, but you know, compared to his top, I believe he had a 110 in the cigar mile. He's he's clearly he clearly was better than that on his best day before. And like like you guys said, he, he might be he's probably going to the Pacific Classic next, going a mile and a quarter. Probably answer some more questions there. Might go to Saratoga, but I don't know. I'm sorry, Bill, I interrupted you. Oh, no problem. And your your thing was better than mine anyway, so I'm glad you did. <laughs> so, anyways, I want to go back to a couple more points you said. Um, uh, going over the weekend's races. I don't disagree about anything you said about Sister Charlie, but I think we're selling um, Starship Jubilee a little short here. This is a really good horse. She won the EP Taylor up in Canada last year, grade one. She's on this winning streak now. And if she were in the Chad Brown barn, she would be the, all the talk and the rage. You know, Kevin Attard is a guy who, you know, is a very good trainer up in Canada, but doesn't get a lot of press down here. And then I want to go back to what something Alan said. He made a comment that he thinks that Volatile is the best sprinter in the country. Why do you think he's better than Vacoma? <clears throat> I think they're talking, I think we're two different horses. And I, I wonder if we'll see them in the forego, if they're going to press on with Volatile to, to the forego or, or not. Um, I mean, I, I see Vacoma as being best at seven to a mile. And I, I, I actually wonder what he would do um, like if six furlongs is too short a trip for him. So I think head to head six furlongs, I think that one volatile. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. And I, I would say going a little, a little bit further, I would want Vacoma. It'd be interesting to see what they do in the Breeders' Cup with the Vacoma because at Keeneland, it's a two-turn mile in the dirt mile, which is not, not that he couldn't stay a two-turn mile, but I think that makes it, the decision a little bit more difficult. I think a one-turn mile, they would have they would have put him in the air for sure instead of the sprint. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens there. But uh, ditto on Starship Jubilee. She's a super cool horse and it was a $16,000 claim. Like that's, and she's made millions now for, for, for those connections. And uh, that's, if, if you follow Florida racing, if you follow Gulfstream, 
you know the Starship horses, the Starship Stables horses. There's there's a lot of them. They all it's kind of like the old Karakora horses. They name all their horses Starship this, Starship that, and they're usually pretty cheap. And it's it's kind of ironic that this one was cheap at one point, got claimed for sixteen thousand, and now she's a millionaire. And yeah, I mean, it's just nothing to take away from her, even though it's Sister Charlie didn't didn't run a good race. You know, she's she's super game, and she used to kind of be a, a, a need the lead type horse, but now she's she's very tractable and she, she can sit off the pace, as we saw with the rabbit in there. The rabbit pulled a shake the bank. You guys remember shake the bank? And, and <laughs> yeah. talking, well, that's what he used to do. I remember even in the Breeders' Cup turf. That was before like you had to qualify for the Breeders' Cup, and they were just allowed to enter him, and he ran off by like fifteen lengths and, and tried to set it up for better talk now. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's kind of what that reminded me of. So as we, as we are in the summer here, we have rapid fire grade one racing every weekend. Now, uh, thankfully Delmar was able to get back up and running. Not so thankfully that was it, that it was racing on a Monday. That was, that, that was a little, a uh, little bit of a pain in the ass, but, uh, we're glad to see them back running. So they have the, uh, the Bing Crosby this Saturday, um, grade one sprint. Interesting that McKinsey is going to run in there. Uh, it seemed like Baffert was was toying with running McKinsey back at Saratoga in the wood, Woodward, but now he's going to run him six furlongs like Setonian after breaking through the gate uh, the other day in the Vanderbilt. Um, Jack Sisterson's going to ship him out west. Says he worked well the other day, um, so that looks like it's actually going to be a pretty big field. We got the Whitney, of course, at Saratoga. Seems like it's mostly going to be a matchup of improbable and Thomas Day Top, but wouldn't sell Code of Honor too short either. He's obviously got a big chance. Um, the other horses, Owendale, not without a hope by my standards is, is going to be in there. Uh, Mr. Buff, probably a little bit up against it. Um, more of a New York bred type horse. Um, see what else we got here. We got also the, uh, the personal ensign. So we're going to see midnight Bizu. So that'll be fun. Always good to see her race. Uh, and then the Allen Jerkins presented by run happy. will uh, <laughs> will be run this weekend as well. Um, that looks like a, a pretty interesting race. No parole. He's going to be in there. We had Tom Amos on a couple of ago to talk about him. And uh, looks like it's going to be a pretty big field. Collusion Illusion, Eight Rings, I think, is going to be back in there. Uh, I haven't seen Eight Rings since uh, the Breeders' Cup. And he's uh, he's the horse that showed a lot of promise very early on. And then it seemed like the wheels kind of fell off on him. Um, but Baffert can obviously have him ready off a long break. So it'll be interesting to see how he runs. Uh, Mysterious Alex is in there. Tap it to win turning back out of the Belmont try. So that's going to be a pretty interesting race. It'll be interesting to see how the pace shakes out. Um, so a couple of good races over at Saratoga. We've got the Clement Hirsch on Sunday at Del Mar. Um, might have the friend of the show, hard not to love in there along with CC. So I think that pretty much um, runs it down. But Al, what are you looking forward to most from this weekend's races? I know you're a big McKenzie guy. Um, I mean, I do like McKenzie. I, the, the decision to run him six furlongs is puzzling at best. Um, he's another horse I think is maybe best seven furlongs to a mile. And it was obviously brilliant to win the, uh, the winning last year. But, um, I, I, you know, I like him. I just wonder what, you know, what the thinking is going forward. Then, I mean, this has to mean he's not a British Cup classic horse. I, I guess Breeders' Cup dirt mile, maybe, but, um, you know, Collusion Illusion is interesting in there. I thought they might actually send him across country for the, um, for the Jerkins, but maybe they think he wants six furlongs. And then the other race I mentioned Saturday at uh, Del Mar is the, um, the Shared Belief Stakes, which is only going to have a field of four, but um, Honor AP, Cezanne, uh, Thousand Words are in there. So uh, some Kentucky Derby points online in that race. And, and the only thing I'll say about McKenzie, Allen, just to, just to, to, to dovetail on that is I think also they're looking at, you know, from a stallion standpoint, um, it's nice to say that the horse, you know, was a grade one winner, not only going nine furlongs, which McKenzie won, uh, you know, in the Whitney, but then if he can win going six furlongs, it's just another way to differentiate yourself by being able to, you know, promote, Hey, he won grade ones in multiple years. He won it going six furlongs. He won it going nine furlongs and everything in between. Um, you know, cause he's, he's just not, I mean, he, he look, he made three and a half million dollars already and he's probably going to be the favorite in the grade one sprint this weekend. Um, but he's not anything where when you talk about the top stallion prospects coming in, he's probably not in the top three or five and that's no offense to him or his camp. Um, but he's not, you know, he, he just isn't, 
that that flash excitement that people look at. He's a five year old now, um, and I think they're trying to recapture the fact that he was a Grade One winner and hopefully kind of end his career, um, you know, showing his versatility as you know in the Grade One level. So I think that's part of the process. Yeah, I think the Met Mile was the race they wanted to win. Um, yeah. It all went wrong for him last year with uh, um, with all that trouble that that he had last year. Um, and you know, having to run into Matoli that way, but um, and then didn't run so so well this year. But you know, I think as a stallion prospect, it's a conversation for another day. But it's by street sense out of a good uh, mare that Bernie Flint used to have called Runway Model by Pichonville. So I think as a stallion prospect going forward, um, like the fact that he's five doesn't doesn't bother me at all. Um, you know, I want to rack up as many Grade Ones between now and then as as possible, but. Um, yeah, I think he makes an interesting stallion prospect for the future. Again, a lot to look forward to this weekend, every weekend now with uh, with racing fully back and in the swing of things. So I just wanted to touch on this briefly. There was something that, that looked real bad the other day at Parks. Uh, it, was, it was at the end of the 10th race uh, on Monday at Parks, and there was a three or four horse battle down the lane. And if you watch the replay, you watch the outside horse, uh, you can see it better on the head-on, but um hector caballero who was riding the horse caballero incidentally spanish for gentleman this was not very gentlemanly of him after like basically right after the wire he wound up cocked back and basically punched the horse with the whip in his neck and it was clearly just you know a vindictive type thing like the race was over he wasn't like trying to get anything else out of the horse it kind of reminded me a long time ago probably like, I don't know, 12 years ago, something like that, 11, 12 years ago, Jeremy Rhodes at Delaware Park. And they, he was he was a really up-and-coming rider. He had only, he had ridden a fleet Alex to wins and the Preakness and the Belmont only a couple of years earlier. He was like a pretty big-name rider, even though he was still riding at Delaware. But it was a similar situation. This That was even worse, I think. But it was like right after the race, and he reached back and he smacked the horse in the face with the whip. And it was, it looked so bad. He could have blinded the horse. And I think he got, he, I think he didn't get really suspended for that long. I can't remember exactly what the punishment was, but it felt, it felt pretty light at the time, but I think it really damaged his reputation. And I think that that is kind of the reason he isn't riding on top circuits anymore. Um, you barely ever see him riding anymore. That, it, that just, it's the kind of thing that, you know, I got to give credit to the industry that, you know, saw it. And I can't say that this is a hundred percent why he doesn't ride that well anymore. Could be a b- bunch of reasons, but I thought that that was, you know, kind of very poorly received in the industry with good reason. We'll see if there's any consequences for Hector Caballero. I mean, this is the kind of thing that you, I honestly think that you could reasonably support a lifetime ban for this kind of stuff because it's just so unnecessary. And in a sport where we're struggling, you know, like I said, I don't want this to get into a whole whip discussion again, because we've been there, done that, but in a sport that's that's struggling to, you know, explain why we need the whip, uh, why jockeys need the whip in certain circumstances just to use it in you know pure uh, pure abusive fashion like that i think it's the kind of thing that really needs people need to the spark stewards really need to come down hard on him and you know it, it remains to be seen i i almost i almost never expecting you know stewards to actually do their jobs and suspend people for long periods and find people big amounts of money but you know I'll, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt in this in this case just because it has gotten some traction on social media, and I think there are a lot of people who are more tuned in to animal welfare and the way racing, the optics of racing are perceived right now. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens there. But it was just just a terrible look. No need for it. And you know, it's just it's the thing we can't allow to happen in racing. So I'll, I'll toss it over to Bill now. Well, Joe, uh, Roman Chapa is riding in horse racing. So you know, yeah, but but yes. but he's it's like. There's a very minimal amount of mounts that he's getting on a small circuit. I don't think, yeah, I think he should be banned for life too, but that was just one Oklahoma gave him like a license, but I see what you're saying. Go ahead. Sorry. It's, I believe he's riding at a rap hole. Look, I don't want to stick up for this guy. That's the last thing I want to do, but I don't think a, a lifetime ban is really in order here. Uh, but I do think something along the lines of, of 90 days or something. And, and yeah, I, I mean, even though it's an ugly situation, you have the stewards at parks that are on top of it. It looks like something is going to be done. And, and racing has gotten to a better place when it comes to these sort of things. I do think if this happened maybe 20 years ago, you know, they, they might have called the guy in and say, don't do this anymore. It looks really bad. You know, it remains to be seen what they will be doing. If I'm a steward, I look at something like 90 days. Um, but it's very straightforward. Whether you give him 90 days or the rest of his life, 
what he did was reprehensible and he definitely needs to be punished for it. Yeah, I think I think we need to say his name a couple more times because that way people know who he is in, in the racing industry. It's Hector Caballero, who's a, um, a you know, a 14 percent win percentage tra- a jockey, excuse me, at, at Parks to set the stage. He was riding a horse that had only run once before, and that was sprinting. And now they were asking her to go two turns for the first time, over a mile for the first time. And in the beginning of the race, you know, like most races in the beginning, you know, she got bothered a little bit. He had to pull her back. Then he started, then he made a decision to go to the rail when there was only a little bit of an opening. He got cut off again down, you know, down the back stretch. So he made two mistakes already in, in the race on a horse that was running second career start, first time going long. And then at the top of the stretch, he started hitting her and he hits her. I can actually count it because I watched the video a number of times. He hits her 13 times from the, from the going into the turn to the top of the stretch until the, uh, until the wire. And then he punched her with his whip hand after they hit the wire um, and, and then and wrote her out. So no question excessive whipping, no question animal abuse, quite frankly, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, and misuse of the whip. So there's three different counts that, that the, the parks stewards can, uh, you know, can look at. Um, and, then, and then because the racing gods are, are so silly, the horse actually finished second in the race, but won the race because the horse that actually hit the wire first got DQ'd. So it's bad enough that the, that the guy does all these terrible things onto the horse um, and asking the horse to, to perform first time going long in a hundred degree heat index. And then he abuses the horse down the stretch, punches the horse at the wire, and then gets and then gets the win. I mean, that, that, that's the irony of all ironies on this on this whole thing is that the horse still ended up uh, you know, finishing first in, in, you know, in, in the race. Um, but the most important thing is this has to be addressed. Um, there are times where, you know, certain things go on in the industry and we kind of say, well, that's the business or, well, that's unfortunate or, you know, that that's really too bad. We'll get them next time. This is the next time this needs to be addressed and needs to be recognized. And if the, I know a lot of the stewards and a lot of the trainers at parks listen to our show. So I really hope that they are listening to what we're saying about he abused this horse to try to get her to win. And it was because of mistakes that he made during the race. So he has nobody to be mad at, but himself because the horse performed extraordinarily despite all these, you know, all these uh, things that were thrown in front of her for running long, the second race of her life. Who was the trainer? Um, The trainer is uh, Silvio Martin. And the owner is John, John White or John Witt, W I T T E. So if, if for no other reason, those guys need to be, you know, need to recognize that this kid, this, this rider um, did them no favors, you know, other than, than winning the race. Where, I couldn't really tell. I watched it several times. So where did that take place? Was it, was it prior to the finish or was it, you think no, it, it was, was like a, an expression of frustration after the finish? It was definitely, definitely just after the wire. Yeah. Just yeah. after the wire. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and you can see it on social media. You can see it even on, on the, uh, on one of the, on Equibase, if you want to click on the race, um, because, because there was an inquiry of the race, they actually show it over and over and over again. Uh-huh. I don't think they mean to, but because it's literally like the stride after the, after they hit the wire. So aside from it being a race where three or four horses all hit the wire kind of, you know, within a photo, um, then there was an inquiry. And that's actually, I think, why there's so much buzz about this, because if you watched it the first time, you kind of go, did he just hit the horse, like physically punch the horse? Or was it just like he air, he air punched it, you know, like after, after the fact. Um, but no, he physically struck the horse with his he had the whip yeah. in his hand, but it was a it was a ball fist and he punched it as opposed to, to whipping behind him. Yeah, I guess I wonder, um, I guess I'm not going to say I'm surprised, but like, why hasn't there been any action taken yet or at least um at least somebody in a position of authority with pennsylvania racing commission or or the steward saying hey this happened we're aware of it and we're looking into it has, has that happened has anybody seen that to be hearing on thursday there's no okay. hearing on thursday they said but that's all they've said they haven't said anything right. about um you know if it's disciplinary hearing or if it's just a review hearing because i guess i guess right. um you know part of the protocol is anytime there's an inquiry they need, they have to bring the jockeys in to go over the race anyway after the fact um and then they decide if, if you know what the punishment is for the for the uh you know for the inquiry 
We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. This week's news is sponsored by West Point Thoroughbreds. Owning multiple grade stakes winning racehorses like Hard Not to Love and Decorated Invader are attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Check out why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtb.com. So a couple things we, we wanted to touch on before we get out of here. Uh, there was news uh, yesterday that Del Mar is going to start to allow owners on the track. Um, I want to I want to get the exact uh, parameters of, of who can be on. It says up to two licensed owners per entered horse can attend the races at Del Mar. Um, prior to this week, owners had not been permitted for afternoon racing under the COVID-19 health protocols, which were apparently very strict, but not strict enough to test the jockeys. Um, it says first come, first serve. Uh, they have to stay in the clubhouse. They can't go down to the winter circle or the paddock or anything. It says they have to social distance and, and uh, wear masks. It says they have to undergo a full COVID-19 health screening, including a temperature check. That's not the same thing as a negative test. So I don't, I don't know about all that. Uh, uh, maybe. It's, a, it's a questionnaire and a temperature is what they're doing. I mean... That's to me. That's absurd. Like to me, to not to have a to have a policy this late in the game where you don't require a negative test for someone to be on the grounds. Like, you know, it's not. It's, it's not for mo for most of America. It's not a problem to to get a test now. And you know, I understand the delay sometimes is is a little cumbersome, uh, up to a week in some cases. But usually, you can get it back in a day or two. Like, there's no there's, there's no good reason unless Delmar has a. California has a shortage of tests that I'm not aware of to not have a required negative COVID test to get on the, the grounds. With that being said, um, I think if it's, if it's a limited amount of people and they stay away from each other, they wear masks, not allowed in the winter circle or the paddock, I think it could reasonably work out, but it's just I don't know, like a week late, a week after having to cancel racing um, because all the jockeys tested positive for coronavirus to now be like, okay, now we can have owners in. I don't know. It just seems seems a little uh, a little ballsy to me, honestly, um, to to do that at this point. But you know, hopefully it works out, and and there's there's no issues from it. But it's related to something that happened the other day uh, at Monmouth, where in in the winter circle for horologist who won the Molly Pitcher was uh, co-owner Cameron B, and he's now banned for the rest of the meet, I believe, from coming to Monmouth because he was not supposed to be in the winter circle. Now, Monmouth is a different thing because Monmouth is racing with some fans. So I, that seems a little bit hypocritical to me to have, you know, potentially thousands of fans in attendance and then draw the line at the owners being in the winter circle. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know about the logic, logic of that one, but I'm curious if you guys had any reactions to that news. Well, a lot of the rules out there, there's no logic to. Everybody's just trying to make it up on the fly. So as you said, and Cameron Beatty is a 28-year-old kid. Uh, he uh, got involved in this horse horologist kind of on, on a, a whim uh, and wound up with, you know, a horse that's going to be the best horse he probably ever has in his lifetime, even though he is only 28 years old. So he wins the Molly Pitcher and he's caught up in the moment, his exuberance. He takes the horse into the winter circle. It's all over the place, including a huge ad in the TDN in the next day from New Jersey Thoroughbred Breeders showing him leading the horse into the winter circle. And, you know, the explanation out of Monmouth was there's a rule. He broke it. It's a very serious rule. Um, I, I would say that, that, you know, that's albeit that's true and that, you know, maybe he deserves some sort of punishment. I think banning him for the rest of the meet is a little bit excessive. I, I, I think that maybe, you know, one week or two weeks or something like that. But it also makes me wonder if maybe there's not more to this story that we don't really know, that they were getting heat from the governor's office saying, you know, we see people not wearing masks. We see this, we see that, what's going on over there. And maybe they made an example of him to say that, you know, we really are taking this seriously. Now, um, so far he can run his horses at the meet. This is only going to affect 
him as a patron. He's not allowed on the grounds. But, uh, you, you know, I think most people concurred. You know, you look at everybody judges what the feedback is on social media these days. And pretty much it was universal in support of him. A little bit tough to throw this guy out for the rest of the meet. Yeah, and, and, and I understand racetracks, you know, having to um, stick to their protocol and stick to their rules. Um, and, and I think the problem was the fact that he did win and he did go to the winner's circle and it, there were ads and there were articles written. Um, so it was really the, like literally front page news of look, you know, look at how good this horse did. And then kind of parenthetically, a secondary story developed of, oh, and by the way, he wasn't supposed to be there. So I think they kind of got caught between a rock and a hard place um, saying that he's banned for the meet. You know, the meet's only another month or so, so or, or six weeks. So it, it's not really that that big of a deal. But for a young owner who's developing horses and we as an industry are trying to develop owners, you know, to come into the business, um, it's a it's a tough pill to swallow where, hey, congratulations on winning the race. But oh, by the way, you're not allowed to come back for the rest of the meet because um, you know, because we caught you. Um, it, 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 I think Mammoth was, was really caught. And I think Mammoth is looking at it and saying, we can't risk the millions of dollars that flow through here um, on, on wagering. Um, and this is kind of the poster child for what we need to do. And we need to set an example. Um, and I think that's why they're, they're kind of caught, you know, having to, to actually follow through with this type of thing. If it was a more established owner, would the answer be the same? I, I think it would be, actually. I think it probably would be. Short of Dennis Drazen winning that stake and bringing the horse into the winner's circle himself, um, I think pretty much anybody in that position would be, you know, would have been um, suspended from attending races for the rest of the meet. You know, you can question the severity. I guess my issue is that ahead of the meet, I think it was made perfectly clear to stakeholders what you can and can't do and if if the rules are there if they're laid out and it's incumbent upon owners and whatever else whoever else is involved to like be aware of those rules if you if you breach those rules there are going to be consequences so we can debate back and forth whether it should have been a week or or the rest of the meet um i think there were protocols and and steps to follow and he um, either knowingly or if you believe him unknowingly broke those rules and now there's a price to pay. I mean, the owners are the, are a backbone of the business. We, we need them and, and they want to celebrate their successes. I get that. But like the rest of us, we kind of all have to, um, mind our P's and Q's right now and, and do what you have to do. So, you know, it sucks. Um, it's a great three. You want to celebrate it, but um, you know you got to play by the rules. Alan, I, I think I think I understand. And I'm I'm a rule follower, so I understand what you're saying. It's better for society if everyone you know within these within society you know follows the rules. But I think it's hysterical. I think it's so ironic that we as an industry sit here and say there are rules, there are rules, there are rules, and yet there are trainers that are breaking rules. You know, medication wise, there are owners that are breaking rules. Um, you know, encouraging the, the trainers to do things. There are jockeys that are breaking rules with regard to their weight or, or whether or not they're, they're, you know, excessive use of the whip and things like that. And, and it's almost like, um, you know, the, the one, the one, you know, sheriff in, in the wild west that's standing there, um, you know, with no bullets in his gun saying, whoa, 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 everyone needs to follow the rules. And, and like nobody is. So it's really hard for me. And again, I'm an owner, but it's really hard for me to, you know, to, to come down on this kid. Um, who in exuberance wins a grade three um, on Haskell day. I mean, what, what's better than that on a horse that, you know, shipped out to California and then came back. He's a Jersey bred. Um, you know, this, the, the, the guy has a great story. He was a professional athlete that got cut short because of, of illness. And this is like his way to get involved in sports. And he was exuberantly bringing a, you know, doing what other people have done a hundred, a thousand times before, which is lead the horse into the winner's circle. Um, so to me, you know, I understand about following rules and stuff, but I, I think it's laughable that as an industry, we're picking on this one person, um, who didn't, who, who in a moment of, of exuberance, um, not in negligence, you know, is getting, is getting brought in and saying, you have, you're the one, you're the one that we're going to go ahead and, and, and put this banishment and, and this, uh, you know, the, 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 this, uh, punishment on, um, when there's so many other people throughout the industry, racing, breeding, 
pin hooking that that just you know could give a crap about the rules and get enumerated uh, you know because of it. Hey, I think you want to race, John. You want to race stakes race at Monmouth a few weeks ago. Yep. Would you have thought about coming to the winner's circle? Probably, yeah. But I but I watched it from home only because I'm I'm germ phobic and and don't like people. So I, I if if I could just watch every race from home, that would be great for me as far as I go. But look, you know, but Alan, I, I agree with what you're saying. I also know winning a race, you 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 lose your mind, you lose your shit. I mean, uh, I'm sure, it's, yeah. It's, it's exciting, um, and and you can't think. And and I know, like being interviewed for races afterwards, and then listening to the interview, and I'm like, where was my head at? It's because you're not even thinking. You're so excited about all these things that you had to overcome to win this race, and it's in your home track. And then, you know, and then of course you're going to do it. So, you know, look, I'm, I'm so proud of my home track. I'm actually wearing my Mammoth Park Breeders' Cup shirt because wow. I love Mammoth so much. I just think that they have heavy handed on this one. <laughs> Is it still wet? It's still wet in the armpits. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we didn't need to know that. At all. No, no. I meant, I meant all the rain. Oh, uh, oh I get it. <laughs> wrong. Yeah, that makes sense too, Joe. Okay, I see where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I mean, the thing is, with, with, you know, my problem is, they the problem that they potentially have is having fans on the grounds. You know, if you're going to have thousands of fans on the grounds and then come down on a guy for walking his horse into the winner's circle, like I think that's that's a little bit hypocritical. And I don't know, maybe the governor did lean on him, uh, lean on Monmouth, but you know, it's just it, it it seems ridiculous. He didn't sneak onto the grounds. Like it wasn't like you know he he broke into the winner's circle. Like he was allowed to be there. He just wasn't allowed to be in the winner's circle. So. I don't know if you're going to have thousands of fans on the, on the, on the, uh, at the track and then, you know, you know, ban a guy for a meet for going to the winter circle. It seems a little bit ridiculous. I just want to mention this before, before we go, um, Al mentioned that owners are a backbone of the industry. Another backbone of the industry is backstretch workers. And Mike Kane had an interesting piece in today's TVN about how there has been a drastic reduction in H2B visas that are given in this country. And, you know, theoretically, like the, the most charitable way that you could put this kind of decision from this administration is that they want, they, they at a time of high unemployment, they want more American workers to be working. Um, and they want to get people, you know, back into participating in the economy that were born Americans, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, like, this is, there are certain jobs that just regular Americans don't want to do. And a big part of it, a big, a big one of them, at least in our world, is backstretch work. Like it's it's extremely difficult, and it's long hours. You got to wake up at three thirty, four in the morning. It's extremely physically demanding work, dealing with thousand, two thousand pound animals. So I just I, I just wanted to mention that because it's it, it that's the kind of problem that trickles up, and it it causes major issues, even for big stables like Todd Butcher and Chad Brown. Mike did a good job talking to a lot of different people about how, how this affects them. And, you know, they're going with a skeleton crew a lot of the time now. And it's just, people need to realize that, you know, immigration in America, a lot of times the immigrants are doing the jobs that you don't want to do yourself. You know, I'm not going to say the majority because I don't know, I don't know the statistics, but a large part of immigrant labor in America is, serving the function of doing jobs that regular Americans don't want to do. And I just wanted to mention that real quick because it's, it's, it's affecting our industry and it's affecting a lot of people. And, you know, it's just, it's so easy to like, to say, Oh yeah, immigrants are, are stealing our jobs and all that, but you don't want to go pick fruit. You don't want to go pick strawberry in a freaking 110 degree heat. Do you like these people are doing a service for you? Like, so that's, I just want to mention that real quick because it is something that has a deep effect in the industry when you reduce these visas by so much. Like it's just you're not going to be able to fill those jobs, and it's 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 a difficult it's difficult skilled labor, and you need people that are experienced and skilled in that you know in, in that arena. So so I wanted to mention that. Good job, Mike, on that story. Hopefully, it's something that gets sorted out over time. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses at stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtb.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds.
guest of the week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So our Green Group guest of the week this week is the president of Hillendale Farms, John Sakura. Thanks so much for joining us, John. Uh, thanks for having me. Sure. So we wanted to have you on because, you know, the the big sire in the news, I think, this week, um, at least stateside, was violence. He stands at Hillendale. Uh, he had the grade one winner in Volatile. He had a grade one winner not too long ago in No Parole, who was supposed to run again this weekend in the Allen Jerkins. He's an interesting sire because he got up to basically like a rocket ship start in his first crop, had a little bit of a lull after that, and now seems to be really coming on again. Uh, what do you attribute his resurgence and his success that he's going through right now? I think, you know, anytime a horse gets off to a great start and he has multiple talent, talented individuals, that, that lull is usually attributed just to bad luck or circumstances. You know, once a horse shows he has the genetic ability to produce good horses and produce multiple good horses, then, you know, if his lead couple of racehorses, one gets hurt, one bled, one got sold. You know, it doesn't take much to, to bring you out of the news. And if you believe in a horse um, and they have multiple good horses, you know, the, you're, you're, you're almost certain to have a recurrence. You'd always have the recurrence two weeks before the September sale or as you'd plan it. But uh, I think good sires are good sires. And once they get you know, multiple good horses, it's bound to happen again. And I can think of so many circumstances where horses got off the mark well or they're quiet getting started, you know, and, and there was just a, a build up sort of a, a foundational success. And all of a sudden, you know, two more winners, a stakes play sources, a stakes winner and the pipelines filled. And then there's sort of a, a tsunami of, uh, of success. And, you know, with violence, there was such a, a huge expectation the way the yearlings sold. I think that the bar was very high. He certainly met that bar. It got quiet, quiet. People got, you know, sort of offended because they were expensive. And he was supposed to be the heir apparent of Medaglidoro. What happened? And, you know, the, this, uh, uh, we, we have a marketplace that, that is so exuberant one way where they jump on the bandwagon where a horse is great. He gets quiet. He's no good. And, you know, I, I think that, that, that in all marketplaces, if you can, if, if you can um, just hold back a little bit and it just follow a trend and not jump in or not have a, an unrealistic expectation or be hi hypercritical, that in the long term that you'll probably view and handicap the, the sire the right way. And, uh, you know, with violence, he was sort of victim of his own success. People were expecting, you know, multiple great one winners every, every week. It was probably unrealistic. It's some horses got hurt, some that retired. And, you know, the pipeline was full in that he bred a lot of mares. He bred a lot of good mares. And, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing his ability now. You know, it, it's, he's an interesting horse in that in his first crop, he got fillies. He got turf. He got two turns. And now he has two grade one winning sprint horses. So I think it bodes very well uh, for the success of the sire, showing that versatility. He's multidimensional. You know, he's a big, handsome horse and really couldn't come at a, a better time with the September sales right around the corner. And, uh, you know, he's proven he can get the horse, uh, resource of the ultimate ability. And uh, they were, we're right back on track and, uh, you know, head, heading upward. Um, so I feel very good about the position. Now, you know, my, my confidence in the horse has really never wavered or shaken. But, you know, the, the reality was, we we provided a price break this year because stud fees should be dependent upon you know not only sales success but racing success. Too often people don't see that that you know both ends of the business are interconnected and you know you sell these shillings to be racehorses. So I, I I think you should be buoyant in terms of success. Um, you know when horses are 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 winning at the highest level and I think the the breeder deserves a you know, a break when things are quiet, they get a chance to double up if they believe in the horse, they get value. And, uh, you know, you can sell that value you know, by being in full support when others were, were, were uncertain. So 
Um, it's worked well. We're happy about the position. We're thrilled the fact that he has two very good sprinters. There's others in the pipeline. You know, there's two-year-olds ready to run that uh, we've heard very good things about. And uh, I think it's uh, onward and upward. Bill? I'm going to pass to John. Oh, okay, great. John, it's uh, John Green from DJ Stable. Thanks so much for uh, for coming aboard. Um, we've noticed that over the past couple of years, you've picked up a number of top race fillies, Lady Eli in 2018, and then Take Charge Brandy and others um, last year. Um, what what's the the thought process on on buying these you know Grade One and and or Champion race fillies to add to your broodmare band? Well, I think in a, you know in every marketplace, in in, in order to to sell at the top of the marketplace, you have to differentiate your consignment from others. You can be reliant upon, um, you know, the, so, soliciting retired mares as boarders. You can represent others at auction, which we do those things. But the best way to control your your destiny is to own those kind of mares yourself, to breed them to elite sires, and really draw people to to your consignment. And uh, you know, I, I've I've tried to really focus on you know um, quality um, to having an, an appeal that is unique on you know in, in our consignment and uh, if I look back over you know some of the successes we've had it's all it's all about those you know about the quality and we try to represent and be part of quality in all aspects of the business certainly stands are harder they're you know they're very expensive assets. Um, we've, when, we, when we've reached to uh, get involved in horses like Curlin, you know, we 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 I, I bought better than honor, and 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 you know, I, I think quality is really the hallmark of what we strive for, and also you know, kind of pointing a mirror towards ourselves, and that you know, I never feel that we're satisfied, never feel that we've arrived. It's all about striving to improve, to overcome some of the disappointments not all mares that were very good race mares are going to be producers you know you have a success and failure rate in every aspect of the business and the only way to sort of try to stay quote loaded and and full of quality is to every year strive to get better try to improve and and you know that's in all all aspects of of, of what we do and uh, you know, statistically it's a not to make it simplistic but you know the best race mares Overall, long term, produce the best resources. If you can sort of combine quality pedigree with performance, with confirmation, breed those bears to elite sires. Hopefully, you know you're going to have the kind of yearlings on the sales grounds that the, you know that the biggest buyers, the most serious international people, will uh, will, will find that 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 suit. And you know, that's how we've been able to you know top several sales and you know have several world records at auction. Is to just try to have quality, and then you know you have to have luck, you have to have cooperation, and that covering sire or sire of that fuller yearling happens to have a great year. Um, the horse has to vet. And, you know now we 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 have we we wonder about this world economy and how things are. So there's some things you can't control, others that you can't, and uh, you know the the business is all about luck and. We know no matter how well prepared you are, you know, any, anything can happen that uh, um, that can get your way. And then sometimes horses that have, you know, lesions or problems that you worry about, they they go the right way. And, uh, you know, so if we have multiple well-bred mares, we have multiple yearlings of that uh, ilk and caliber, then hopefully every year we'll have, you know, one, one or more yearlings that, that, that can compete to uh, – be sale toppers and and uh, appeal to the elite buyer. And, and John, one more follow up question for you, and, and then I'll hand it over to Al. Um, you and I have, have both been very outspoken about the concern about the Jockey Club rule, uh, the 140 mare rule, um, and I think we landed on the same page for a lot of the same reasons. Um, that that you know whether or not it, there, it's going to help the overall industry is is a question, but. Um, you know, can you can you just respond to our podcasters as far as why you're either for or against the 140 mayor rule going forward? Well, I, I think that's a long, a long conversation. There's lots of implications, lots of concerns. So if you set that aside for a moment, 
not trying to be evasive, but the support or non-support, the my by the one issue I feel very strongly about, I think it's a fatal flaw in in this bill, is that whatever the rules are, they must be applied equally to everybody. And if it's going to be 140 mares, then there has to be a year under which every stay in that breeds in North America uh, must comply with and have the same rule. You know, we talk about this lack of consistency. The Jockey Club can, complains about the lack of consistency in different jurisdictions as far as medication, various control issues, and now an edict which, you know, sort of gets right in the middle of free enterprise, uh, free commerce. They say, well, if you're breeding before 19, uh, before 2000, uh, born in 2020, you can do whatever you want, but everybody else has to breed 140 mares. And I, uh, you know, I, I believe in fairness. I believe in uh, competition, but I don't believe in any competitive edge. And, you know, these stands will breed 15, 18, sometimes 20 years. And if genetic diversity, if uh, uh, lack of concentration of, of one blood type or lack of concentration of one sire in the sales ring, giving you know, more opportunity to others is the goal. And if it's a, an immediate and anxious goal and important to the industry, which they state as the premise for the rule, then it must apply the same day to everybody. It's counterintuitive to say we have a crucial law that must be passed today. We'll go out in a limb, we pass it, but it only applies to some, not all. You know, it's, you know, we're in this pandemic now. So if, if, if the rules are to wear masks, then every store has to wear a mask, not yeah, I must wear a mask everywhere except McDonald's to give them a competitive advantage or whatever. There's the endless analogies, but my bar is open till midnight. Yours is open three in the morning. And the only difference is I open my bar in 2020. Well, it's just, it's not fair. So take a side, whether you like the rule or, or don't like the rule, an, an equal distribution of the rule to everybody seems to be not only common sense, but 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 fair and uh, there's no advantage to uh, one group or another. And if the advantage is just based upon the date of birth, that that doesn't seem like a, a legal threshold or a, a logical way to enact uh, such a uh, a sweeping change in the business. Hey John, Alan Carrasso, how are you? Good, thanks, Alan. Good. Um, I want to talk about your stallion roster and, and within the context of bringing Ken Theros to, to Kentucky. In my mind, bringing a, a stallion to Kentucky from a regional market it has to be one of the riskier plays in the stallion business. Although it's worked well in the past, Mr. Prospector came from, from Florida. We know what, what he accomplished. Malibu Moon moved from Maryland to, to Kentucky. He's become one of the, the greatest sires uh, of modern times. Um, Talk about, take, take us through the process of acquiring a stallion like Cantharos from Kentucky. What, what is it that you identified that thought that made you think that he would be a good fit in the Kentucky market? And then reflect for a minute on the, uh, on the success that his first Kentucky bread crop has had this year. He's had uh, five winners already and, and it seems like it's going the right way. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it, it, it's, it's guesswork and feel to a degree because once all the questions are answered, it's probably too late. So it's a balance between there's more to achieve, but you feel it's more likely than less likely to happen. And that's the time to, to, to make that move. But you really have to, I don't know, you really have to think about it because, you know, project earnings, number of stakes winners are important, but if, if they're all based on, state bred races if they're all based upon you know a, a a small pool where a horse annually succeeds in that group but you know those offspring don't have the ability to compete in the larger group the graded stakes the open stakes grade one races etc then the move to kentucky is a, you know is a disappointing one it's much like any you know a high school athlete that is going to play in a local college and be successful or can 
can he play at a D1 school, whatever the sport might be, and succeed. So um, you have to have a feel for it. Um, you're really you're you're betting on the horse, and you're betting that that you know the quality of mares that he bred, the success that he's had is really disproportionate to the opportunity in a positive way. And I've looked at Quinteros and I looked at the stakes winners and looked at his winners and then, you know, started to see horses to be great at stakes winners and outside the group of restricted racing. Well, that was very exciting. And then, you know, X, Y, Jet and uh, World of Trouble. And, you know, you're starting to get gray wall winners and champions. And, uh, you know, that, that, that was all uh, those are all added benefits, but uh, he's a really good racehorse. He threw a good type, and we believe that that he would certainly fit a niche in the in the Kentucky marketplace. And the, the you know the hope is always that without limitation he'll continue to ascend the sire ranks and uh, you know go to the next level. And I bred really good mares to him on my own. The partnership with uh, Barbara Bank is one that you know that I personally cherish and and. You know, they've supported him. So, we, we you know, we've had a, a really good group. And he's one of those horses that is sort of an organic groundswell of support. A lot of people really believe in him. He's priced fairly. It's a real opportunity. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, you know, that support, a lot of it's come from without, not from within as far as the conversation about what a good horse he, people think he's going to be. And, you know, he's on his way upward. He's, he's very mobile. He improves his mares vastly and all the things that you'd want are, you know, a lot of people are saying, repeating and uh, believe that to be true, uh, you know, aside from, you know, Hillendale and, and those parties that might have a bias or a, uh, a, a benefit from, from saying that. So it's nice when you have that authentic support from, from without, not just from within. All right, John, I think that's all we got for you. Thanks so much for the time, continued success and drive safe. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, John. No Appreciate it. Bye now. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, John Sakura will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Remember, entries for the industry-leading Keeneland November breeding stock sale are open until August 3rd. Learn more at november.keeneland.com. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, Alan Carrasso, our Green Group Guest of the Week, John Sakura, our producer, Patty Wolf, our editors, Anthony LaRocca and Danny Seiper, and our production coordinator, Michelle Sabrino. Thanks for watching. Wear a mask. I will see you next week from Brooklyn. 